Tonight we are in Job chapter 29, and we're going to we're going to study slash read through three chapters tonight. This is Job's final discourse. And what a discourse it is. All right, you all ready? Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. God, we thank you for your word tonight. And God, in this volume of scripture that we'll be reading through and studying, we need your Holy Spirit. We need him to speak to us, to open up our eyes, open the eyes of our heart, dear Lord, tonight that we may see you high and lifted up with the train of your robe filling the temple with glory. God, we pray that you would just take your almighty hand, and just as you wrote on those stone tablets so many years ago, we pray that you would write upon the tablets of our heart tonight, that you would write, Lord, your your epistle, that you'd cause us to be living epistles this evening, and, and God, tonight, that we would surrender to those things that you have to speak to us. We pray tonight that your blessings would be poured forth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you guys know we've been kind of making our way through this interaction that Job is having with his three so-called friends. Job actually called them miserable comforters, and you know, I kind of liken this to a three-round uh, UFC title fight, right? I mean, it's Job and then his three friends going back and forth with Job three times. And so we just had worked our way through uh, that final individual making their case against Job. And now finally, Job is going to give to us his closing comments. These are the final words of Job. And then after Job speaks, there's another young man that comes along named Elihu, and he shares for a number of chapters, and then God speaks. And so, you know, we're really almost uh, at the end of this book. But tonight, what you're going to see, if you know, you're one of those people that needs to have an outline, you need to kind of see how it rolls out. Tonight, we're going to see that Job gives his uh, final closing arguments. He's going to make his case. He's going to look all the way back and reminisce on the good old days of his life, which is interesting, and we're going to point out tonight why that is significant and interesting for Job as he's been kind of walking along this path, as he's been on this journey with the Lord. It's interesting where God brings him. He is going to, in chapter 30, lament over his current calamity, so he's going to dig back again into his current situation and how desperately difficult it is. And then in chapter 31, he's going to give his final defense. He's going to identify seven things, uh, beginning with the heart, after he talks about the consecration of his heart before God, he's going to identify seven things that he had walked faithfully in, and in his own heart and mind, and we know this is true because we have hindsight, and we can see the heavenly perspective on this, Uh, He believed in his heart and his mind that he had a clean conscience before God. And he's going to identify seven things uh, in his self-defense before these individuals that would prove that. And so beginning in chapter 29, he begins to reminisce about the good old days. Verse 1, Job further continued his discourse and said, Oh, that I were as in months past, as in the days when God watched over me. So Job now is beginning to look back. Remember when Job began to talk about this journey he was on and all of the calamity that befell him. Uh, And this book is shocking. You know, when you see somebody that was as high and exalted as Job was, brought down so low, uh, and, you know, the description of Job's suffering is unparalleled. You know, none of us really know someone that has suffered to the extent that Job has. It's shocking to us. You know, it's... It's overwhelming, and sometimes in our mind, you know, it causes us to fear. We think, dear God, please don't do that in my life, right? I mean, thank you for this happening in Job's life so I can learn through his example, but, you know, no thanks. I'll pass that, you know, on to one of my brothers or sisters, you know. Maybe you want to do it in their life, but don't do it in mine. And Job's initial response was, remember, he cursed the day that he was born. I mean, this overwhelming emotion came like a flood for him. He lost his seven seven sons. He lost his three daughters. He lost absolutely everything. All he had was this wonderful woman of God that was encouraging him with her sweet, tender, loving words. Moi, moi, moi. 
And so what does he do? He curses his life. He says, man, cur I curse the day that I was born. I wish I'd never been born. You know, have you ever been at that place in your life where things just seem so absolutely miserable and you're just so torn up on the inside that you think, God, it would have been better if I was never born. Well, this journey he's been on has lasted for months. As Job has said here, he begins to look past his you know, desire that the day he was born would be cursed. He looks past that and he goes all the way back to that last time he was experiencing the blessings of God. In his own word, he says, that that was just months ago. Some people say that this journey Job had been on from the time his suffering began to this point right here may have been up to 12 months. So a year of this overwhelming suffering. Job looks back and you know his perspective is beginning to change. He's not as torn up in all of the emotions that he initially had been. It wasn't as if he was cursing the day that he was born. Now, now he's beginning to look back and say, you know what, those were good days. You know, those were good, compared to the days that I have right now, those were good days. And he begins to reminisce, and he begins to ponder, and he begins to think about those days where he said, God watched over me. Now, we're going to highlight that in just a second, but notice how he describes these days. In fact, the whole chapter is dedicated to how good his life was before this suffering. He says in verse 3, when his lamp shone upon my head, and when his light when by his light I walked through darkness, just as I was in the days of my prime, when the friendly counsel of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me. You may want to just identify that. We're going to come back to that in a minute. And then he talks about some of the aspects of the goodness of his life. When my children were around me, when my steps were bathed with cream, and the rock poured out rivers of oil for me. So Job looks back and he begins to reminisce first about his relationship with God and from his perspective how good it was when God was watching over him and you know he connected all of the prosperity in his, his life to God watching over him. When things were good, Job would say, that's when God was watching over me. That's when God was with me. That's when the friendly counsel of God was covering my tent, when I was prosperous, when I was successful, when my family was flourishing. He talks about the good old days when his children were um, around him, running around him, and of course he lost all of his children. When his steps were bathed with cream, remember he was the richest man in all of the East, and so, you know, how significant was his wealth? He kind of gives the picture that wherever he went, you know, it was just good and luscious and, and beautiful, and everything he did, everything he touched uh, was prosperous. It was almost like the rocks themselves were pouring forth oil at his very command. But you know, it's interesting as he mentions this, as he looks back and he connects his prosperity with God watching over him and God being with him. And he says, as he looks back, and you know, when we go through tr troubles and calamity and suffering, sometimes we do the same thing. Sometimes we look back and we say, well, that's when God was really with us. You know, that's when God was moving in my life. That's when God was watching over me. And you know, he makes a mistake that sometimes we make as well. Did God ever leave Job? Did God ever stop watching over Job? You know, was the friendly counsel of God no longer over Job's tent? You know, sometimes we feel this way, right? We, we have uh, this tendency to feel that when we're not being prosperous or we're not succeeding, or when our life is not blessed, that God is no longer with us. And I just want to remind you tonight that that's not true. You might be walking through difficult times tonight. You know, there may be suffering in your life that nobody else knows about. And you may be saying this, God, where are you? Right? Because that's what we ask of God when we're suffering. Because none of us expects to suffer in this life, whether we want to admit it or not. Now, theologically, you guys might say, I know that the Bible says that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will experience persecution. Jesus himself said that uh, in this world we will have tribulation. But man, when that tribulation comes, uh, oftentimes, you know as well as I do, we're shocked by it. We certainly are made to be uncomfortable in the middle of it. And the first reaction we oftentimes have is this, God, where are you? God, how could you abandon me? 
I want to remind you tonight as believers in Jesus Christ that God has not abandoned you and God will never abandon you. And even if you're walking through times of tribulation, uh, you know, God is with you. And it's in those times especially, I believe, that God wants to reveal His presence to you, something maybe even more valuable, certainly more valuable than all of the prosperity you could have in your life with respect to wealth and upward mobility and things that the world considers good, something even more valuable than that is experiencing the tangible presence of God. When God himself is comforting you, when the Holy Scriptures are being opened to you, when the presence of God is heavy upon your life, that is more valuable and that is more significant than all of the wealth of the world. You know, when I was in sixth grade, uh, you know, in sixth grade, I was a little heathen in sixth grade, all right? I mean, that's when I started drinking beer and smoking dope was in sixth grade. I know, it's crazy, huh? But uh, I was up in Oregon, <clears throat> not that it all started there, which wouldn't be a surprise because this is a pretty crazy state. <laughs> but I was hanging out with some friends and I was getting presents for my uh, family members and, uh, you know, I came across this poster and even in my unregenerate little heathen attitude, this, this poem ministered to me and it touched my heart. And I want to share it with you tonight because uh, maybe some of you have heard it, maybe some of you have not, but it really kind of illustrates for us how close God is to us during times of difficulty, and it's called Footprints in the Sand. How many of you have heard it? Raise your hand. All right, well, it's still good, isn't it? All right, it goes like this. One night a man had a dream, and he dreamed he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes from his life. For each scene, he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of his life flashed before him, he looked back at the footprints in the sand, and he noticed that many times along the path of his life, there was only one set of footprints. He also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times of his life. This really bothered him, and he questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I've noticed that during the most troublesome times in my life, there's only one set of footprints. I don't understand why when I needed you the most, you would leave me. The Lord replied, my precious, precious child, I love you and I would never leave you. During your times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. And you know, I think that is so beautiful and it is so true. You know, as we look back, what we see in hindsight is that it's during those times that the Lord carried us and the only way that we make it through the difficulties and trials of our life is because that God, in fact, has his almighty hands underneath us. Job's going to learn this. Job, at the end of his discourse and after Elihu has his opportunity, and then as God speaks, what he's going to realize is that it was the very strength of God that was upholding him. And I want to suggest to you tonight that in your times of trial, it's the very strength of God that's going to uphold you as well. Well, the story goes on. He begins to kind of qualify how good it used to be. Verse 7 says, When I went out to the gate by the city, when I took my seat in the open square. So remember with me in those uh, Old Testament cities, the gate to the city was the place where the elders were, would gather. It was a place where the wise men would gather. It was a place where the individuals who were esteemed in the community would come and they would sit and they would judge over situations and circumstances that were happening in the community. And he says, Job says, man, when I went out to the gate, when I took my seat, typically there were five seats that were dedicated to the elders. And Job is saying, man, I had a significant position. I had a position of sophistication among the people in the city that I was dwelling in. And when I sat down, notice number one, he says, the young men saw me and they hid. The aged arose and stood. So both young and old respected me. I was honored in my community. The young men, man, they were in such great awe of the wisdom that I had that when they saw me, they literally ran from my presence. And those who were older, remember, in these Old Testament cultures, uh, the elderly were honored. The elderly were respected. It was the younger people that would rise in the presence of the older people. You know, honestly, I think this is something that our culture so desperately needs today. You know, we need to 
return back to a place where we honor and we respect those who are of age around us and those who are of experience. And Job says, man, even the individuals that were older than me, when, when I came and I sat down, they stood, they arose, and they respected me in my presence. But not only that, notice verse 9, the princes refrained from talking, and they put their hand on their mouth. The voice of the nobles was hushed, and their tongue stuck to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard, then it blessed me, and when the eye saw, then it approved me. So Job says, man, even the princes, even the nobles, when they saw me, man, they trembled in my presence. You ever been around somebody that you really, really respect and you almost get to that place where you're afraid to say anything because you don't want to look like an idiot? It's better for someone to think that you're a fool than for you to open up your mouth and to prove it completely. You know, I've had that experience. I remember the first time I was hanging around Pastor Chuck. You know, it's like... uh, you just, you're nervous. I'm, you're nervous on the inside and you're afraid to say anything because you don't want to look like an idiot in front of uh, Pastor Chuck. And so your tongue almost like clings to the roof of your mouth. And, and uh, I remember the first time that we were hanging out together and he looked at me and he asked my opinion and I just like fumbled over all my, no, 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 no. <laughs> fumbled over all my words and I walked away and I'm like, man, I'm never going to be in this ministry. This is over for me. But this was the way it was with Job. The princes and the nobles and the elders, man, they respected him so much they were afraid to even say a word in front of him. And this is why, verse 12, because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper, the blessing of a perishing man came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. Listen, this section is Job's autobiography. So much of what we know about this man comes from his uh, final words. From his last self-defense, he says this, when, when I sat down in the gate of the city and the elders gathered, people who were in need, people who were marginalized, people who were suffering, people who were struggling, the widow and the poor, they knew that they could come to me and that they would be delivered. You know, Job had this reputation. He was a godly man. He was a godly man in the way that he raised his kids. Remember with me, we looked at that in chapter 1 about five years ago when Job every morning got up and he made sacrifice and he interceded and he prayed for his kids by name. But it wasn't just that his godliness was demonstrated in his family. Job was a man who delivered those who were in need. This is the heart of God, you guys. What is pure and undefiled religion? that we minister to those who are fatherless and that we help those who are widows, right? This is where oftentimes the true love of God is demonstrated when we're reaching out to the people groups that God has a heart for, that God wants to help, those who can't help themselves, those who are defenseless, you know, those who are being marginalized by our society. Job demonstrated his godliness by reaching out to these people. And, you know, sitting with elders who probably so oftentimes wanted nothing to do with these poor, miserable creatures, they found defense with Job. And then not only that, but also righteousness, verse 14. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. So Job knew the scriptures that were available, probably handed down at this point through oral tradition. He knew what was right. He was able to discern Uh, definitely between um, situations where there was something that was being perpetrated that was wrong and God's will being done. He was able to bring righteousness to bear. I was eyes to the blind and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor and I searched out the case that I did not know. I broke the fangs of the wicked and plucked the victim from his teeth. So those who were evil, you know, they feared Job. They feared this man because Job was a man who could see right through their disguise. And Job dealt with them definitively. But then notice this. Job talks about broken expectations. Verse 18. Then I said, I shall die in my nest and multiply my days as the sand. My root is spread out to the waters and the dew lies all night on my branch. My glory is fresh within me and my bow is renewed in my hand. What is Job saying? Listen, Job is saying, this was my expectation. Life was good, man. Everywhere I walked, it was like cream was being poured out in front of me. Everything I touched, even the rocks, it was like they poured out oil. 
Everything I did was successful. I was honored by the young, by the old, by the nobles, by the princes. I defended those who couldn't defend themselves. I was able to discern between unrighteousness and righteousness. And listen, this is what Job says. He discloses his heart. He says, this is the way I thought it would be forever. This was my expectation, that I would die in my nest, that this was going to be the way my life was going to go all the way until death, that I was going to have this success, that it would just be perpetuated, you know, that my days would be multiplied as the sand because I was living righteously, because I was doing things God's way, that God was going to honor me and multiply my days. Not only that, but Job discloses his heart during this time. He had this idea as well that his family would be blessed and that, that his family would multiply in number, you know, and that his family would love and would honor God. This was his expectation. He had this expectation that his success would just continue to mount and to grow and ultimately that his life would be daily being renewed. But man, his expectations were broken. You ever have expectations broken? You know, maybe things that you expected God to do for you. Maybe, you know, a condition or a situation in your life that you just kind of expected to continue on, and then all of a sudden, you know, life changes. Some of us like change, and some of us don't. Some of us feed on change, and some of us hate change. Some of us have had expectations. Now that we're believers in Christ, this is our expectation on what we believe God should do, how God is going to work, you know, how he's going to deal with us, and invariably what happens to us, those expectations are broken. You know, we think, well, you know, I put my trust and faith in God, and so from now on, I know that I'm going to have a job, that things will be well-ordered in my life, that my marriage is going to be healthy and strong, that my kids are always going to walk with the Lord, that my ministry is going to be blessed. And you know, not long into your walk with Jesus Christ, man, some of those things got turned upside down. And maybe your ministry wasn't as blessed as you wanted it to be. Maybe things happened that you didn't expect would happen. You know, maybe that job that you thought you were going to have, that you expected because you were a believer in Jesus Christ, you would have upward mobility and it would be your source of security Till the day you died, that was turned upside down. You lost your job. You lost your business. Your expectations have been broken. You know, I think this is one of the hardest things in life to deal with. You know, when we have expectations of God and those expectations ultimately are broken. You know, there's only one who sees the extent of our journey from the beginning of our life to the end of our life. And it's not you. And it's not me. It's God. You know, we can't even see past this second right now. Right now. You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, because the truth of the matter is, death can come for any of us at any time. You know, we can't see the end from the beginning. That's why we need to live in a place of faith, where our expectation is that our desire is to discover the will of God and simply be faithful to Him. You know, this is my perspective on life, all right? And so I believe it's biblical. You can take it or leave it if you want to. If you leave it, of course, you're in sin. If you believe it, then <laughs> you're walking in the Spirit. But the choice is yours tonight. I believe that God has a plan for our life. I believe God has a definitive plan for our life. I believe that God has a plan for our life that has been founded from before the world was ever even created. And that when we're born again into the kingdom of God, our privilege now is not to tell God what to do, our privilege is to discover what his will for us is. I don't believe that we have to shoot in the dark. I don't believe that we have to take a, a leap of faith in the dark. I believe we take a step of faith in the light. I believe that we have this privilege to pray, to seek the face of God, to ask him what his will for us is, and that God will progressively reveal that one single step at a time. You know, I, I think a lot of us struggle with this, man, because we want and particularly in our culture, okay, you understand this doesn't work in most other cultures in the world. We want it all mapped out. We want the job that we're going to have. You know, we go, we get an education. This is what we've committed our life to. We're going to invest in this one specific area, you know, of work. We're going to build our 401k program. We've already picked out the place that we're going to retire, you know, which golf courses we're going to frequent. 
the places we're going to vacation, you know, maybe the full care facility that we'll ultimately die in someday. And, you know, we, we want to map it all out. And I just want to tell you, you know, you can do that, but don't be all torn up when your expectations are broken. There's a better path for you. And there's a better path for me. And this is the path for you and for me to discover the will of God day by day. You know, when we went out to New England, this was the prayer, all right? And in my mind, I knew it may not work out like this. But when we went to plant a church in New England in 2001, 11 years ago, this was the hope. The hope was, God, you know, we're going to start a Bible study. Just read Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. We're going to begin with the prayer meeting on Tuesday night. And you're just going to, like, bring people, okay? This is how you're going to do this, God. We're going to start a prayer meeting, and then the house will be full in like two weeks. We'll start a Sunday service, and then there will be a great revival. You know, I read all of Finney's books before I went to New England on a revival and what revival is all about. And so, God, you know this is a work of your spirit. This has to be your will, because I know you want people to be saved. So this has to be your will. And so we stepped out in faith, and we started a prayer meeting, and it was miraculous. People came. But it was hard work, and it took time. And it wasn't that hundreds of people came. It was one single soul at a time. It was learning to love one single person at a time. It was God teaching me, God teaching Rachel, the importance of faithfulness, all right? The importance of faithfulness. Whether the church is 2,000 people or whether the church is 20, what God has called me to is faithfulness with what he has set before me. And I want to suggest to you, it's the same for you. What has God set before you? He has the right to change it tomorrow. It may change tomorrow. But what has he set before you today? It's the divine will of God. Everything that exists in your life is the divine will of God for you. Are you being faithful? Are you pouring your heart into it? Not for a man, not for a boss, not for a pastor, not for yourself, but for God, because you've determined in your heart to do all unto the glory of God. And this, there's one thing that's required of a steward of God, Paul says, and that's faithfulness. Jesus says on that day, as he welcomes us into his kingdom, he's going to say, well done, good, and faithful. Yeah, he doesn't say, well done, good, and successful in the eyes of the, of the world. He doesn't say, hey, for all of those of you who have a yourname.com ministry, you're going to be blessed. He doesn't say that. He just says faithful. Be faithful with what God has set before you. Faithful every single day, realizing that he has the right to change it if he wants to. So, where were we? Verse 21, chapter 29. So he says, men, listen to me. And they waited and kept silence for my counsel. After my words, they didn't speak again. And my speech settled on them as the do, right? So he's got this picture. It's like he speaks, everyone shuts up. And it's just the glory of his words falling on their hearts. They waited for me as for the rain. And they opened their mouth wide as for the spring rain. And God was bringing this through Job's life. And he was a vessel uh, in the Lord's hands. If I mocked at them, they didn't believe it, and the light of my countenance they did not cast down. I chose the way for them and sat as chief. So I dwelt as a king in the army as one who comforts mourners. Now he moves into a lament concerning his current calamity. But now they mock at me, men younger than I, whose fathers I disdain to put with the dogs of my flock. All right? He's like, the worst possible thing has happened to me. Do you wonder if Job ever saw people who were really suffering in his community and he thought, dear God, please don't ever let that happen to me. I mean, that's bad. That would be miserable. Listen, Job's worst nightmare came true in his life. Job's worst nightmare. It couldn't have been worse for him. The younger people, he's talking about individuals who are the troublemakers in the community, who had fathers who were uh, known and notorious for their ungodliness. It wasn't that he was being esteemed and respected and honored anymore. It was that he was even being reviled by this group of rabble rousers. And notice what he says, Indeed, what profit is the strength of their hands to me? Their vigor is perished. They're gaunt from want and famine, fleeing late to the wilderness, desolate and waste, who pluck mallow by the bushes 
and broom tree roots for their food. They were driven out from among men. They shouted at them as at a thief. They had to live in the clefts of the valleys, in the caves of the earth and the rocks. Among the bushes they brayed like donkeys. Under the nettles they nestled. They were sons of fools, yes, sons of vile men. They were scourged from the land. So Job's just beginning to describe how miserable his life has become. He looks back on the glory days and he says, man, if I could only go back to those times when life was so good, but look what's happened to me. The lowest of the low in the community. Those people that were so miserable, so bad, these, this group of young people that were so despised whose fathers weren't even rejected, they weren't even worthy to put with the dogs that governed my flock. He said, those guys, that group of people, they now despise me. I'm not even honored in their own eyes. And this is how bad it was for Job and this group of people. Now I'm their taunting song. Yes, I'm their byword. They abhor me. They keep far from me. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. And so these guys, this group of guys, hey, did you guys hear today that uh, they found a 20-foot great white shark off of the coast of Mexico? Did you hear that today? Did you guys see pictures of that? Like, is that your biggest nightmare or what? Swimming in, okay, this was how messed up I was as a kid. I watched Jaws, right? And it so totally messed me up that when I got in the swimming pool, I was afraid that somehow a shark was going to attack me. All right, is that dysfunction or what? Anybody else there with me? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I love you guys. I'm so glad you did not leave me hanging out there. Like, I would be swimming, and all I would hear is the... Let's all do that together. <laughs> Job was surrounded by sharks right? He was surrounded by sharks. This group of kids so totally despised him. They mocked him. They used every foul word that was available to them to describe him. And then they did the most disrespectful thing a person could do in the East. They spit in his face. This group of young boys would walk past Job. Remember, he's going to describe his suffering in a minute. It was just absolutely miserable. But as Job was sitting in a pile of ashes, and as he was scraping his boils that were infested with worms off of his skin with a pot shirt, right? As he was struggling, he had chronic diarrhea, and literally his skin was falling off. These young men would walk by, and they would mock him. They would revile him. They would sing songs about him, and then they would spit in his face. There was nothing more uh, dishonoring in Eastern culture, even today, than for someone to spit at you. And Job's face would be covered by spittle as this group of boys would walk by. Why? Verse 11, because he's loosed my bowstring and afflicted me. So he says it's because God's allowed it. God has allowed this suffering. God has allowed me to be despised by people. God has allowed me to be rejected. At one point in my life, I was the most honored and revered person. Every single individual in the whole East respected Job. But now Job would say, but God has allowed me. God has brought me low. God has humbled me. You know, the Lord will allow us. I want to remind you, the Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. You know, the exhortation of Scripture is that we would choose to be humble before God. Sometimes we say, Lord, we just pray that you would humble us. Well, he, he's going to do that. All right, you can count on that. But really the exhortation of Scripture is this, that we would choose to be humble before God, that we would humble ourselves. And you know, there are times where God will allow us to be humble, where he will allow us to be rejected, where he will surround us with people who despise us. And you know, in those times, sometimes our reaction is to fight against that. I want to encourage you instead, embrace it. You know, allow those times, allow people's attitudes, no matter how vile they may be towards you, allow it to work in your life. Allow God to humble you. Embrace that and entrust yourself to the Lord so that your reaction towards those who may even be your enemies will be love instead of bitterness and anger and hatred. He says in verse 11, they've cast off restraint before me. At my right hand, the rabble arises. They push away my feet. 
They raise against me their ways of destruction. They break up my path. They promote my calamity. They have no helper. Job says they don't even need help doing it, man. I am like fair game. I'm an easy target. They've come as broad breakers. He's speaking of uh, the waves that would crash against the sea. This is the way they were. They would just break against him. Under the ruinous storm, they roll along. Terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my honor as the wind, right? They made sport out of despising this man. And my prosperity has passed like a cloud. And now my soul is poured out because of my plight. The days of affliction take hold of me. My bones are pierced in me at night. And my gnawing pains take no rest. My great force, by great force, excuse me, my garment is disfigured. Uh, the word garment could also be translated his skin. His skin had been disfigured. It binds me about as the collar of my coat. He has cast me into the mire, and I have become like dust and ashes. Verse 20, I cry out to you, but you do not answer me. I stand up, and you regard me, but you have become cruel to me. With the strength of your hand, you oppose me. You lift me up to the wind and cause me to ride on it. You spoil my success. You know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. So Job struggles because all he is hearing from heaven is what? Silence. He hears nothing. You understand that God has not spoken a word to Job yet, that the man has gone through times of unparalleled trial and suffering. He's cried out to God, and yet what has he heard from heaven? He's heard absolute silence. You know, one of the hardest things for us to deal with is the silence of God. You know, when you and I are going through difficult times and we're crying out and we're saying, God, why? Why has this happened to me? How come this is being allowed in my life? God, how do I get out of this problem and this struggle? Which way do I turn? What do I do? And as you pray and as you read and as you seek the face of God, you hear chirp, chirp. You hear nothing. You know, how does that affect you? How do you respond when that happens to you? Sometimes our reaction is to become bitter. We get angry at God. You know, we begin to question God. We begin to doubt his promises. We begin to wonder if he truly has a plan for our life. That's one path we can take. The other path that we can take is to trust him, to allow that silence to compel us to dig in deeper in our relationship with him. This is, and I've mentioned this to you before, you know, when we were teaching the kids to walk, this is what we would do. And I don't think this is bad, but some of you may think this is abuse. But anyway, we would get them in a place, right? Like Alec, he crawled really for a short period of time, and he started holding on to stuff. He started walking. Hannah crawled for a longer period of time, and Levi was like wrestling right away, okay? I mean, he's a UFC kid. But with Alec, he would get up, and we would, uh, you know, Rachel would stand him up, and he would begin to walk, and I would back up. You ever do that as a parent? Okay, so you're with me. So, and he would, right, progressively, he would begin to walk further and further, pretty, you know, beginning with maybe a couple steps into the arms of dad, and then, you know, as we would day by day begin to do this, I would progressively back up 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet, pretty soon Alec is walking all the way across the room, right? He is learning, he's growing, he's maturing, there's muscle memory, there's mobility that's being developed, pretty soon my son is walking, Listen, I want to suggest to you that the silence of God does the very same thing in our lives if our heart is right. What is God doing? He's teaching us to walk. We walk by faith, not by sight. And God is saying, come to me. You know, when Alec got to me, I didn't take my hands off and let him fall on his face. You know, good job, little buddy, and kick him in the rear and turn him around and go the other way. That wasn't it at all. He'd come to me, I'd have the big grin on my face, and when he got to me, man, I'd gather him up in my arms. And the silence of God is designed by God to do the same thing in your life and in my life. It is God, listen, not rejecting us, listen, it's God not rejecting us, it is God beckoning us to come to him. It's like a parent calling their child to themselves and teaching that child how to walk. The silence of God 
teaches us how to be mature believers. And this was what Job was learning. Verse 24, surely he would not stretch out his hand against a heap of ruins if they cry out when he destroys it. Have I not wept for him who is in trouble? Has not my soul grieved for the poor? But when I looked for good, evil came to me. And when I waited for the light, then came darkness. So listen, this is what he's saying, man. Is this what I get? After all I've done? After all the good I've done? You know, I helped those who were suffering. I wept for those who were in trouble. My soul grieved for the poor. And then when I was going through my difficulty, what did I get? Is this all I get? You know, sometimes we have that attitude. I've done this for you, God. You know, and I've poured out my heart, and I've sacrificed, and I've been a good boy or a good girl, and this is how you treat me. I just want you to think this through, all right? Because that's sometimes how we treat God. Why do you do what you do? Why do you do it? Why do you serve God? Why do you give for the kingdom of God? You know, why do you sacrifice? Why do you bless other people? Why do you give five bucks to the guy who's at that intersection, who's poor, who's a Vietnam vet, and needs some help? Why do you do it? You know, do you do it because there's some exchange that you think is happening with God? That, you know, the more you do that somehow, uh, you know, all of that's going to come back to you in this life? Do you, do you, is that why you do it? Do you do it to just satisfy yourself? Or do you do it because it's the right thing to do? You know, you do it because you know that this is what God has called you to do. This is how you and I need to serve. We need to serve without expectation. You know, in your job, you serve with your whole heart for the glory of God. You may never get that raise. You may never get that opportunity for upward mobility. And your reaction when it doesn't come should not be bitterness. It should not be frustration. It should not be anger. Because the reality is, you're getting exactly what God wants you to have. You know, in your ministry, as you pour your life out, and maybe your ministry doesn't work out the way you want it to, or opportunities that you desire don't come. Listen, do you trust the sovereignty of God enough to believe that you are exactly right where God wants you? Or are you doing the things that you're doing in, in a way to somehow twist the arm of God to get what you want? You know, this was where Job was at, right? Job's saying, hey, I did all this good, and what do I get for it? Well, you know, calamity. Verse 27, my heart is in turmoil and cannot rest. Days of affliction confront me. I go about mourning, but not in the sun. I stand up in the assembly and cry out for help. I'm a brother of jackals, a companion of ostriches. All right, you know, life's not good for him. My skin grows black and falls from me, right, when your skin dies. Uh, literally, skin was falling off of the body of Job. My bones burn with fever. My harp is turned into mourning, and my flute to the voice of those who weep. And so chapter 31, Job makes his final defense. I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my steps and count all my, excuse me, see all, does he not see my ways and count all my steps? So as we briefly look at chapter 31, you're going to notice there are seven things that Job identifies that he had walked righteously in. He had walked righteously in integrity, in fidelity, in authority, in mercy, with respect to idolatry, hatred, and stewardship. All of these things, Job had behaved uh, in a godly way before the eyes of God. But listen, he begins with his heart. All of this begins with the heart. He says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Job says, before I even begin to talk about my acts of righteousness, I've got to talk about the heart. Because righteousness is all about the issue of the heart. My eyes, I'd made a covenant with my eyes. I obviously have a wife, I'm married, I love her, and so I made this covenant that I wasn't going to set my eyes on any young maiden. Job is talking about the issue of the heart. Listen, where your eyes go, right, your eyes are going to go where your heart directs them. Jesus talked about the lamp of the body being the eye. 
And if the eye is full of darkness, how dark is the darkness within that body? Why? Because if you and I are setting our eyes on things that God doesn't want us setting our eyes on, that just simply reflects the condition of our heart. And so Job is saying, listen, there's a consecration that's happened in my life. I've not just consecrated my eyes with a covenant, I've consecrated my heart. I've determined in my heart that I'm going to live in a way where my whole life is consecrated to the Lord, set apart, devoted to God, walking in purity, honoring Him. And that began with fidelity concerning his wife. Paul would say this to the Thessalonians. He would say, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and in honor. You guys, we live in a city that makes a living off of feeding people what they want to see, right? I mean, everywhere you look, there is some advertisement that is enticing some lust of the flesh. You know that this is true. Right? I mean, you see a billboard, and it's got a T-bone steak and two eggs over easy, and it says, you didn't think I was going to mention that first, did you? And it says, you know, $4.99 breakfast at wherever, you know, uh, and in many ways, what's that trying to access? The issue of gluttony in our life. We live in a gluttonous community. You know it. You see it. You drive down the strip, and, and everything is attractive to the eye, and our eyes are going to go where our heart tells them to go. It's not just an issue of wearing blinders, right? Jesus says, man, if, you're, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it from you. It's better for you to enter into everlasting life uh, with one eye, you know, than not at all. So what was Jesus saying? That, you know, if you have a struggle with your eye, cut it out, pluck it from you? No, we would all be blind if that was the case, right? I mean, we would all be blind sinners if that was the case. Jesus is saying, listen, it's the issue of the heart, and you need to take dramatic measures to make sure you're living in a way that is honoring to God, consecrating your physical body, but also consecrating your heart unto the Lord. This is how Job lived, and I want you to notice very briefly in these seven things. Number one, verse five, integrity. If I walk with falsehood or if my foot is hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way or my heart walked after my eyes or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat. Yes, let my harvest be rooted out. Job says, man, number one, with respect to integrity, God knows. I've honored him. I've determined to tell the truth. I've not walked in falsehood. I've made sure that my steps were straight before the Lord. Verse 9, fidelity. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I've lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. For that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment, for that would be a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out all my increase. Job says, man, I've had fidelity when it comes to my relationship with my wife. My heart hasn't been enticed. Because listen, if it had been, that would be wickedness. Do you guys understand this evening that adultery is wickedness in the eyes of God? And you're thinking, why do you need to tell a group of Christians that adultery is wickedness in the eyes of God? Because you have no idea how many times I sit in my office and talk to people who have lost everything, all right? Everything. It's not just one indiscretion. It's not just a, an experience of pleasure for a moment. I'm telling you, when you walk down that road, you will lose everything. You'll lose it all. You'll lose your reputation. You'll lose your family. You'll lose your ministry. It will all be stripped from you. This is what Job says. It's a fire that consumes to destruction. And sometimes, man, we're deceived by the devil, and he puts a temptation before us, and, and we begin to become enticed because of the sin in our own heart. Our eyes begin to long for things that God has not given to us, and we begin to justify. You know what? She's never really met my needs in the first place. I deserve something better. 
You know, really, I don't even think this marriage was, was really from God. You know, we weren't believers when we met each other. So, you know, and this sister, man, she, she's really godly. She loves the Lord, right? And you begin to walk down this road of self-justification. I am telling you from step one, it's wickedness. It's wrong, and it will ruin you. It will destroy you. Proverbs chapter 3, we don't have time tonight, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 27. All who take her path go down to the pit of hell. All right, go down to the pit of hell. Maybe you've been playing with fire. All right, I got to say it tonight. Maybe you're playing with fire. You know, maybe there's a relationship that you're beginning to engage in that's an emotional relationship at this point, but it is going down a road that you know in your heart is wrong. I am telling you, it is a fire that will consume you to destruction, and it is wickedness in the eyes of God. And you need to do what Joseph did, right? Joseph didn't hang out. He didn't say, maybe I got a ministry to this woman. You know, she needs the Lord. And he didn't say, have you heard the four spiritual laws? He didn't do any of that stuff, man. He said, I am out of here, man. The dude ran so hard, literally his clothes were ripped off of his back. And you and I need to flee. We need to flee when that enticement comes. Fidelity is so important. Verse 13, if I've despised the cause of my male or female servant when they complained against me, what then shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make them equality? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? Job says, man, I've been given a position of authority, but I've not used that. I've not held that over people. I've not lorded it over people. For those of you who are employers or managers or have a position of authority, remember those people that you are managing and leading are equals. They're co-equals. They're made by God just as you have been made by God. Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 5. He talks about masters over their servants. He says, listen, make sure you are treating those who are serving you with impartiality, honoring them and loving them because your master who is in heaven sees you as well. Job did not misuse his authority. Verse 16, if I've kept the poor from their desire or cause the eyes of the widow to fail, or eaten my morsel by myself so that the fatherless could not eat of it. But from my youth I reared him as a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I've seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or any poor man without covering, if his heart has not blessed me, if he has not warmed, if he has not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I raised my hand against the fatherless when I saw I had help in the gate, then let my arm fall from my shoulder. Let my arm be torn from the socket. For destruction from God is a terror to me. And because of his magnific magnificence, I cannot endure. Job says, I've not despised the need of the poor. I've been merciful in every situation because this thought is always upon me. If I'm not honoring God and helping and delivering those who are in need, the very destruction of God could come upon me. And the very fear of the Lord causes me to walk in a way that honors him. Job kept before his eyes the magnificence of the Lord. Right? Have you ever, don't ever do this, but have you ever been tempted to look straight into the sun? You know, the, when the sun is rising and you look over and man, it's so bright, it's blinding and you've got to put your hand in front of your face because of his magnificence. Job says this is the same way it is with God. His magnificence and my understanding of his magnificence keeps me in a place where I understand who I am, who God is, and who the people around me are, and my, what my responsibility to them is. Verse 25, the issue of idolatry. If I've made gold my hope or said to find gold, you're my confidence. If I've rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand has gained much, if I've observed the sun and it shines, when it shines, or the moon moving in brightness. So Job is saying, if I have worshipped gold, if I have made gold my confidence, if I have an unhealthy respect for my wealth, if I worship the sun, if I worship the moon, if I'm worshipping astrology, 
Listen, verse 27, so that my heart has been secretly enticed, not just the things seen, but the things unseen, and my mouth has kissed my hand. If I am the center of my own universe and I'm worshiping myself, this also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment, for I would have denied God who is above. Idolatry, ultimately, is the denial of God. Verse 29, if I've rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me or lifted myself up when evil found him, Indeed, I've not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. If the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been satisfied with his meat? But no sojourner had to lodge in the street, for I have opened my doors to travelers. So, listen, he's qualifying every single thing. But for those who are against him, Job says, listen, I would deserve justice if my hope was that God would destroy those who were my enemies. But Job says that was never the case. Even for those who hated me, I never wanted them to suffer or to experience difficulty. If I've covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. So listen, oral tradition obviously been passed on. Uh, Job was familiar with the story of Adam. How did Adam try to cover his sin? Right, he hid in the garden and then he took like the worst possible leaf you could take and he covered himself with it. Not sure what the guy was thinking. If you ever seen a fig leaf before, it's really kind of scratchy and itchy, but this is what he did anyway. This is what happened because of the fall. He lost all common sense. But you can't cover your sin. If you think you can hide it, if you think you can seal it, listen, go all the way back to Adam. Your sin, my sin, will ultimately find us out. Because I feared the great multitude and dreaded the contempt of families, so that I kept silence and did not go out of the door. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me, that my prosecutor had written a book. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it on me like a crown. I would declare to him the number of my steps like a prince. I would approach him if my land, stewardship, final one, if my land cries out against me and its furrows weep together, if I've eaten its fruit without money or caused its owners to loose their lives, then let thistles grow instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. Listen, I want to close with this. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Job was allowed by God to struggle. And I want to suggest to you tonight that the struggles in life are good. You know, when a caterpillar is going through metamorphosis and it's uh, in that cocoon, you know, as it breaks out of that cocoon, it's forced to force its way out intentionally by God. Something happens there. If you and I were to come along and say, oh, poor little butterfly, and cut that cocoon open, and let that butterfly out because we didn't want it to go through that struggle, that bu butterfly would come out, it would stretch its wings, and it would fall to the ground and die. Because remember, God has intended that struggle for that butterfly as it's coming through metamorphosis and it's, and it's coming out of the cocoon, as it's forcing its way out, as its wings are pushing against and fighting its way out of the cocoon, it forces all of the fluid to go into the wings of the butterfly, right? And that's how the butterfly ultimately a is able to take its wings and to fly. And the struggles that God is allowing in your life today are intended by him to cause you, to enable you to fly as a believer in Jesus Christ. Man, to mount up with the wings of eagles, right? So that you will not be weary, but that you will be strengthened by God and that you and I walk by faith and not by sight. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this evening, for your word, and we pray tonight, God, that it would just reach down deeply within to our lives. And Father, tonight, that the work of your spirit, God, that sometimes we even ourselves struggle against, broken expectations, Silence from heaven. Battling with tribulation. God, tonight, that the most important thing, as your word says, even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. God, we pray that this work, the work of your spirit,
would continue to grow and deepen us and mature us as believers in Jesus. Tonight, as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, I want to ask you tonight, maybe you need prayer this evening, maybe tonight you've never put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you've never experienced the forgiveness of sins. I've been talking about the plan of God that he has for each one of us, and and you realize tonight that you want to begin to discover God's plan for your life. You want to know the forgiveness of your sins. You need to be right with God. You want to know the assurance of everlasting life. God has been speaking to you tonight. You know this evening you need to take this step of faith. You need to trust in Jesus. And in addition to that, maybe as a believer this evening, maybe you've been wandering. Maybe you've walked away. Maybe there are things in this world that have enticed you and your eyes have drifted from being settled and set on God. And you've been pursuing the things of this world. Tonight, if this is you and you need prayer tonight, I want to give you an opportunity this evening, but if this is you tonight and you need prayer, you'd say, Pastor, pray for me. This is where I'm at tonight. I want to just ask you tonight to raise your hand if this is you. You stretch your hand up high tonight so I can see who you are. God bless you. God bless you too. God bless you in the back. I see your hand over on the left as well. I see your hand too. Father, I want to thank you tonight for these. I pray, God, that you just give them the strength, Lord, to stand up and to be bold and to step forward in this relationship that you so desperately desire with them. I pray, Father, please, that you demonstrate your power in this place tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, if this was you and, and God has been touching and stirring your life, listen, Jesus called his disciples openly. And tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to take that step of faith, to just come forward, perhaps receiving Jesus Christ for the first time in your life, maybe rededicating, recommitting your life. And so I'm going to ask you guys, I want you to be bold. I want to lead you in prayer tonight. The Bible says, whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says if we confess our sin before him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this morning, if you, or this evening, if you raise your hand, I'm going to ask you if you guys would just stand up, come forward right here in front of the altar tonight. God bless you, man. God bless you too. Listen, we're going to wait tonight for you. God bless you. Maybe you're in the middle of a row tonight. That's okay. Don't worry about that. Wherever you're sitting tonight, you need to come forward. You need to come tonight as the Spirit of God has been touching your heart. God loves you. And tonight is a new beginning for you. So we're going to continue to wait as God stirs your heart. Come forward tonight so you can pray and begin this relationship with God in earnest. Anybody else tonight? All right, one more shot. If this is you, you know that you need to come down. I don't wanna, I don't want you to miss this opportunity. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you, man. Love you guys. Praise God. Praise God. All right, I'm going to lead you guys in prayer tonight. I want you to pray after me and just make your prayer to the Lord. He's promised to hear you. Father, thank you tonight that you love me. And God, tonight I confess that I've sinned against you. God, I'm turning away from sin and unbelief. Tonight I'm turning to Jesus. I believe that he died on the cross. I believe that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day. 
And tonight I believe that through faith in him, you have forgiven me. You've cleansed me from unrighteousness. You've made me your child. And you've given me the gift of everlasting life. Father, I love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. God bless you guys.